All right. Yeah. Hey, Austin. Thanks for being the first um, the first brave person to to actually come come on screen. Um, you know, if, if if you want and want to kick off that conversation, you have the honors of, of doing so. Otherwise, um, I would have one or two questions for maybe Egal and Seth to, to start this. And, um, yeah. I'll let you kick it off, Stefan. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, OK. I think of, think of this really as um, I'm, I'm bridging the time until other people feel um, feel eager to you know jump, jump jump in with questions and so on. So please do this at any point in time and don't wait for us to finish our conversation because that could take forever. All right. Um, yeah. So there's um there's there's quite quite a bit happening in, um, in the State Fund project right now. I mean, during this year there have been um, like two bigger releases. Um, a third one is like pretty much in the in the pipeline, pretty much ready. Um, maybe Igal, can you give us a like just a quick summary of like what are, are some of the latest developments? Like you've been the main developer of this. Um, what 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 did go into the last release? Like what features did you like particularly? What what's your like philosophy and um, in those things you're working on right now? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, what's my philosophy? Uh, that that's a big one. Maybe maybe we'll start uh, unpacking this uh, to something simple. I mean, so yeah, maybe the, maybe just like just really like a quick uh, quick recap of what will be released soon. Um, we are, um, uh, I think, the main thing that we were working on recently would be the JavaScript SDK, JavaScript and the TypeScript SDK. This was uh, long awaited by folks uh, from the community. Uh, people were asking about it and we are um, um, we are pretty happy about it. And um, the, the upcoming release would uh, include the TypeScript and a JavaScript SDK. I'm really excited and looking forward to see what folks would build with that. Um, another thing that's like maybe a bit, a bit of a technical thing, but we were, uh, in the previous release, we had, um, um, essentially introduced a completely different transport to communicate with the remote functions and, but we did not have it uh, on by uh, default in this release that would be essentially, uh, enabled. Uh, by default, and this is a um, non-blocking uh, asynchronous uh, transport that is really tightly integrated into the st state fund runtime. Um, so that that's another thing. Um, another thing that was well, this would be really user uh, facing thing, um, folks were asking a way to uh, define a metrics, basically, like uh, uh, um, user-defined metrics um, from the SDK. And this is, this is uh, something that we, um, this will be also part of this release, the upcoming release. Um, so this is like just really a, a brief, uh, brief uh, sneak peek of what will happen uh, very soon. Mm -hmm. If I if I can jump onto this quickly, and then I think I would maybe ask Jamie. Hi, Jamie, who just joined us, um, or even Gordon just joined us. Nice um, for for a quick comment. A, a lot of what what you basically um, explained is basically tooling and scalability um, improvements around remote functions, right? JavaScript S JavaScript SDK for for remote functions. Um, basically, this async transport layer. Is is very much like a scalability thing, right? Like how many how many concurrent like remote remote function containers can can a single fling um, like you know parallel operator or so so service how how resource intensive or how how, how cheap is this you know with with maintaining connections and threads and so on. So this is really meant to to to, to make make the two very highly scalable, independent of each other. Um, like with all with all this going into the remote functions, um, like what's your what's your thought on 
on, on, on embedded functions um, in comparison to those. Um, well, mm -hmm. um, I think, Sophia, I feel like you want to take say something. Yeah, yeah. Seth jumped in, of course, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that remote functions are, um, as this project has developed and people are you know, using it in real production use cases, remote functions are the clear um, winner and uh, kind of exciting use case here uh, because it allows us to have this polyglot system. It allows us to do auto scaling, uh, zero downtime updates, uh, all this really neat stuff that just is never going to be possible with embedded functions. I think that it's moving towards being the primitive layer. So these remote functions are, if you look in the code base under the hood, implemented using an embedded function, right? That's what mirrors it on the runtime side. Uh, if you look in the code base, there's a class called the request reply function. I think where I see the project going is that embedded functions are used to implement primitives. So the way we have remote functions as a primitive of the system, we may have other primitive function types, but I don't see it as the primary way of implementing business logic. Mm -hmm. uh, if I might jump in, um, thinking that, uh, yeah. Thinking that remote functions are what users should really use and um, coming from the last talk on um, comparing Pulsar functions to uh, state fun, uh, there they said that um, Kubernetes was kind of the, the goal and where everybody's kind of headed. Uh, is there anything coming down in stateful function that, uh, I don't know, makes it more Kubernetes native? Um, any function, any uh, features along that route? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so one thing that, yes, we're definitely going to that direction. Uh, well, I would say make it easier for folks that are primarily on Kubernetes to operate uh, stateful functions um, in that environment. And one step that we're going to this direction is basically, it might seem a bit minor, but it's actually decomposing this, like this modules YAML that we had, where previously you had to define everything in a single place. Now we kind of took it to a like, like small pieces, small components, and and the the, the goal really um, is to make this thing a Kubernetes native. So you could you um, the next steps would be to um, allow stateful functions to pick up those resources independently. Um, and of course, like the, the first candidate would be uh, Kubernetes. Um, yeah, maybe maybe to, to add to this, the way um, the way I understood this is like this, it's, it's basically adopting really very much like this resource centric way of structuring it the same way Kubernetes does it. And that actually makes it a good candidate, for example, to putting it into a config map, monitoring this config map and actually really make it Make it make it a system that actually can pick up these 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 changes and so on. You know, by by letting you patch a, a config map instead of updating a YAML and restarting restarting the thing as you'd usually do with the Flink cluster. Um, like back back to back back to what was kind of like the the whole motivating um, thought behind like starting starting out stateful functions and actually introducing the remote functions. It was actually very much looking at. At, um, at a more cloud native way of, of doing event processing, not maybe not, not strictly, let's say, very high throughput stream processing for that. I think like, like the Flink architecture makes sense. But if, you, if you're going more towards the, towards the event driven microservices space, right? There's really, there's really the thought there. Um, there, I think we, like Stefan was just a, a way to look at, okay, what's, what's a different different architecture that actually feels more familiar to, to application and service developers and so on. Like this disaggregation, I think, is, is a big, is, is a very big step because the, the remote functions, you can basically operate them just as, as anything else you, you learned. Um, the, the Flink cluster, which is like the state holder and dispatcher and so on, um, like the Fl Flink project itself is also trying to do a lot to actually make this uh, like a, a much more natural citizen in this space. But um, 
yeah, but I think sp specifically also in, in Stefan with this way, you know, you, you add you add new modules without having to, um, to to restart Flink and so on. Like there's, I think there's a bunch of things working in, in exactly that direction. Like in the end, it should feel very, very Kubernetes native if you wish. It's, it's, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's definitely the declared goal. Um, Maybe I'd like to invite Jamie for for a comment or for a thought here. I mean, if you <laughs> you're brave enough to come yeah. on screen, you should definitely Sh sure. Speak <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a specific thing I'd love to talk about, which is in this model. If you guys have put much thought into multi-tenancy, so how do you have like this base state messaging system supporting lots of applications for different users? And has so... there been much thought in that area yet? So I would maybe um, disagree with the premise that this is a model for running lots of applications on one system. So well, um, that's exactly the question. Is this yeah. model appropriate? Because I, the, I think the goal I is a multi. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I. Uh, th this is what I was, uh, I, I gave a talk earlier today that I was trying to get into this mode of, um, I see state fun as being a model for building the reactive monolith. Mm -hmm. And so I view all the functions that are in one state fun application. So you have a running Flink runtime with the state fund runtime, et cetera, calling out to however many functions built by however many teams. It might be multiple teams deploying functions like you do in a microservice system, mm -hmm. but specifically these are all part of one logical application. And so you can have uh, you know, different teams in different languages, they can scale and deploy independently, but it's still one logical system, right? If one system fails, it's still a single failure domain, you're still bringing down the whole thing. I think that if you have two truly independent applications, those should be separate state fun applications. I don't think you should be sharing the same runtime there. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I, I understand a bit where where, where Jamie is um, coming from in the sense of mm -hmm. the like this dynamic model that that State Fund has is, is it, it's a bit different from Flink in in, in 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 a very specific way that it kind of allows you to kind of multiplex different independent applications through the same processes, right? In Flink, if you actually deploy to deploy different streaming programs, then you would actually reserve dedicated resources. Um, even if you were using, let's say, the same session to run this, right? You would reserve dedicated task slots and so on for um, for every streaming application. And th th that means there is a certain minimal footprint that every application has, which is which is non-trivial, right? So if you're uh, running if you're running like <coughs> applications that process maybe a hundred events per day, it's a very inefficient model, right? And, and State Fund has this has this Way, way more dynamic routing that in theory you can use it as, as something to, to just multiplex a lot of link applications with different topologies through the same through the same thing. Um, I'm, it's, um, it, it's definitely possible to do this. I, I think it's not the most common common use case these days though. Um, it's, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think generally the context should be to frame the whole thing is the, mm -hmm. one of the big unsolved problems right now in stream processing is actually doing sort of cloud native, multi-tenant scalable stream processing for lots and lots of users. Many companies like need to build this or consume it from some service that's provided. And there, there are a bunch of things kind of about this general model that are kind of in the right direction, I would say. The disaggregation of messaging and state versus application logic and all of that, but that's why I wonder if there's been much thought put into like, actually, how do you use that as a core platform, not having N of them, but one, say, per some mm -hmm. cell or something, and then run a bunch of applications. And commonly, I would say, there is really a common case of many teams that are not related, all you need to use the platform, and they do have 
you know, they have independent logic and they have very small throughput. Actually, this is extremely common yeah. in the real world. So all the overhead of like single tenant systems or designs is just way too much overhead for like, solving this. Problem. So yeah, so so I definitely agree <laughs> with that. Um, I think one. How do I want to put this? One advantage of this model that I think lets us kick the can down the road a little bit <laughs> is that because of this dig disaggregated model and the fact that we can scale compute independently of the the runtime, yeah, the runtime can uh, run on much less hardware. Right, I can throw more messages concurrently through fewer cores. Um, and so I don't, I mean, I know that's not really the answer you're looking for, and I, it's, but I do think there is something to be said for um, if I needed 10 cores to run this as a data stream application, uh, because I, you know, each one, each core is processing one slot, so that's one message at a time. And suddenly I can have one slot that's processing 100 messages at a time because they're all being processed by these asynchronous distributed, you know, remote workers. Can I suddenly have that 10 core cluster run on one core? And then does that, again, maybe that's not the proper answer that we want to have in two years, but does that give us kind of the breathing room to really think about this and give people a, mm -hmm. um, I think a viable answer and maybe not the best you know, long-term answer, but I, I do think that's a reasonable thing to say right now. Yeah. I mean, I think you mostly answered it right now. There hasn't been a lot of work towards multi-tenancy mm -hmm. in this kind of architecture. Uh, yeah. So it, it has a lot of promise overall, <laughs> like the direction I think, but, there's mm -hmm. there's obviously problems essentially at the core of the way it works today. How you could do that and have guaranteed quality of service, but you know, not mm -hmm. really? how you would isolate the different applications from each other and make sure that a bad actor can't. You know, yeah, I, I think maybe there's a, a a good analogy to this. So if um, I think if you look at, for example, let, let's look maybe how Presto and Flink kind of differ in in their sql engine right i think you, you can see that in flink you have a like a dedicated operator with a reserved um resource and this this is then you know consuming the streams for one query you can you can think of presto as a bit of a different model right it has this this pool of resources and then it has like all these um these uh preemptible iter iterators if you wish like that, that that process the different queries and it can like just fit a lot of queries in there and actually guarantee like certain fairness between all of them and processing um i think the later thing is something like you would probably want something like that on the on the stream processing side and what what's actually interesting in state one it has it has half of that in the sense of that it makes it makes it possible to to kind of like multiplex different topologies together but it doesn't mm -hmm. yet actually really treat these to these as different it doesn't have a notion of, of the different events that flow through they're coming from different tenants coming from different applications and actually balancing between them which i think you would want yeah, in a with hard multi -tenants. there's no fairness guarantees at all right? yeah exactly um yeah Exactly, and um, it's it's a it's a good question, right? I mean, the there's 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 this basically core of a more dynamic messaging system built on a stream processor, right? And this core can serve as a foundation both for a more multi-tenant dynamic stream processor and for something like an event-driven database or application system like Stateful Functions, right? Um, they both they both kind of built on the same initial core, but they start to diverge, I think, quite a bit after that. And I think the Stateful project has really been following more the event-driven um, application platform uh, kind of direction. So I think the other one is definitely interesting, but I think it would actually yet be another project. It would, like, I think the requirements for that would actually be there would there would be a lot of very special requirements for that that I, I'm, yeah. not, I'm I'm not sure if the, if State Fund is the right project to actually do that just because um, 
I think just like explode the the, the scope at, at at a pretty early stage. Um, yeah. But it's I mean it's a definitely an interesting thought. But yeah, I almost feel it could it would be a separate project to do that. Actually, I have a question. <clears throat> Are there plans yeah. to like build some sort of so like with a lot of actor systems, right? You can pass the message to a function, and if it fails, the whole app doesn't die, but you can subscribe to the fact that it failed. Yeah. And so I wondered, yeah. like currently I kind of have to return a union of like either a function's gonna send back an error or send back a successful yeah. response, or I have to handle sure. errors at the lowest level, which sometimes isn't preferable. And so I was wondering if there were plans to have like a universal way to subscribe to failures of different functions so that you could potentially recover without taking the whole app down, right? <clears throat> yeah. I think there's there's two things in that direction. I'm just gonna throw in the words and then uh, maybe Egal can add a little more <laughs> a little more meat to that. Um, there's there's a big discussion about like general pub sub infrastructure and dead letter queues, which I think goes really well together. And, and maybe Igor can add a bit more color. Um, yeah, I mean this 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 basically sounds like a dead letter queue, um, and this is uh, something that we that was on our radar, but um, um, it was actually actually something that I saw in the uh, talk by uh, Reddit uh, yesterday. I think they they actually implemented something like that in user code, like I mean in their framework. And this is something that we um, would get back to, um, and uh, we are now starting to figure out how something like that would look like because there are many options, right? Like uh, that letter Q. Um, essentially, it can go to like an e egress, for example, or it can go to some user code, and the user code might be in a remote function. Uh, and there's many questions to answer there, but yeah, the, the general direction is definitely go going there. And the second thing is the PAPSA, but this is like an early discussion. We have few uh, ideas, and yeah, we have to see how it goes. Yeah, I, I guess there also may be a distinction between like a failure that's fatal versus one that's potentially recoverable. Mm -hmm. um, like if there was like an unhandled exception, I would expect Flink to like kill the app and retry. But I was wondering if there was like maybe some sort of like defined error types that a function could publish to say I failed. And then someone could subscribe to it and be like, oh, actually, I can recover from that. Or, you know. Like, oh, we could just mm -hmm. retry up to three times and then kill the app, right? And then have Flink retry. Sort of sort of like Erlang, right? Or, yeah, like supervision trees and so forth. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the complexity comes where you have to basically specify this whole thing and configure it. Uh, but we can... Uh, uh, maybe we can follow up on this on the user mailing list uh, or over a JIRA or something like that. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I think generally this like more fine-grained failure handling is it's it's a very it's a very good topic. I think in remote functions you also don't see for every failure flink like going into a recovery cycle, but um, but yeah, I mean more more param parameterizable. Failure handling is one thing we were initially hoping we could avoid supervisor trees in a, in a way because they also tend to like get out of hands really quickly. So if there's a, there's a way to achieve this without opening Pandora's box. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, like, like you guys said, it, like, I, th I think this, this really, we need to get down to the details follow up, like on the user mailing list or something like that. Hey, sorry, hold on, I'm talking. Uh, I mean, two there, chats at the same time. I yeah. muted the wrong one. <laughs> uh, I see that. So there, there are questions are, in the um, QA. Yeah. Uh, why don't I read those and uh, we can go for them. Uh, is it recommended or encouraged to use, quote unquote, heavy remote functions? 
uh, where heavy means long running, resource intensive, et cetera. Um, what about side effects? Um, I don't, can't think about a recommendation to that that way or another. I mean, uh, specifically about side effects, um, really depends um, if you can have the side effects happen through, through an egress, that would be the preferable way. Um, you can get like the exactly ones uh, guarantees like that. Uh, just basically, it would make your implementation cleaner as well. Uh, you will not have to deal with side effects from the remote function. Um, have, have a remote function. Yeah, so what I would say on that is there's no... Um, there's no inherent reason to, to There's not. no inherent reason mm -hmm. not to. Yeah, so mm -hmm. the... Uh, I mean, we even know one well, user is actually using, doing minute long risk calculations in individual yeah. function calls. That's probably... I was gonna say, yeah, so the running, uh, when you call a remote function, that is non-blocking on the runtime side. So checkpoints are still going to go through. We're still going to be processing messages for other addresses. Um, that's what we mean when we say that these things run asynchronously, even if your code on the user side looks completely synchronous. Uh, the only real limit is, if you think about it as a client server relationship between the runtime being the client's user code being the server. Um, that HTTP client does have a timeout on it. And so you do just in practice need to ensure that timeout is long enough for that long running uh, computation. But there's no uh, fundamental limitation that says you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are they completely asynchronous and non-blocking, or is there some limited capacity? Uh, for it's on calls? the address scope, so everything is well ordered in terms of address. Okay. Uh, yeah. One call so per key can be in progress at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So the address gotcha. is the key under the hood, um, and so that is both function type and ID. But yeah, I mean, with the new transport that Iga mentioned, it's really completely. It's really completely asynchronous from the from the flink side right there's mm -hmm. basically i mean there's a, the, a resource of a, of a connection but there's no dedicated thread there's nothing blocking no pool that will that should be running out and so on that's um yeah, yeah. it's probably more an um, issue of managing really the the, the con containers on the um that actually execute the computation that you make sure they scale up um enough to actually handle the long running computation and so on hmm. And then it's in, when an address, quote unquote, is blocked because there's an outgoing uh, process, uh, if messages do come in, we will actually buffer them into flink state so it does not block processing of other messages to other keys at that task slot um, up until some point at that where you can say, OK, that's too much into state. I do want to actually start back pressuring um, in the flink sense. Well, that's actually pretty interesting because that alone could help you essentially allow some users, like say again, if you're multiplexing multiple jobs, mm -hmm. that would allow you to have them independently make progress. Yeah, so that is sort of interesting. That was the one thing I was wasn't sure about at all with the current like implementation is if you can do that. So, yeah, you have to. Um, I mean. If we've done everything right, you have to try pretty hard to have the Flink runtime side of things actually start blocking. Yeah, cool. That's very cool. Hmm. Um, Cheers. Yeah. Uh, sh should There's we run read one more question? In the chat? Yeah. Um, what are slash were the most difficult parts to design slash implement in stateful functions? uh without a doubt like completely without a doubt <laughs> what is the api surface like really like yes that's the hardest thing by far uh really what to include what not to include and how exactly how, how it would look like and how it would be used and involved by far the hardest thing 
And we did some really interesting stuff like in the runtime and, uh, but this is by far the most difficult one. Yeah. I would would agree. It's it's not to be underrated that m much of state fund is just a, an, an an API and and philosophy and protocol, right? This is where where a lot of it is. Like, what is actually how is the interaction between the the, the worker and the cluster defined? How do you design like the, the type system and the and this kind of invoker contracts and and everything so that it actually is polyglot and goes across all the languages comparable semantics and the nice thing is you can actually now have a, a python function and java function talk to each other and like all like all the semantics between everything makes make kind of sense and so on and like that that's i, I have to say Iga did an amazing job in getting that right that's really mostly i think uh like his achievement um is that am, am i saying that wrong Iga? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like the the community, right? And we, we see here Gordon as well, and Seth. Of course, you, yes. I don't want to discount Seth and definitely Gordon, who, who who chimed in and so on. But I think like Iga deserves a special hand there. Thanks. Yeah, I, I mostly just chimed in one night and said that looks confusing. Iga, see if you can go fix it. <laughs> <laughs> I can read some more questions from the chat. I don't know if anyone else wants to uh, jump in with a, with a live question. Hmm. Any, uh, Eagle, Stefan, anything you are oh. uh, excited about for upcoming features or thing, maybe not even plan for release, just direction you'd like to see the project go uh, things that you think would be exciting. Um, yeah, if we if we start with that, we're going to talk to it till the end of the session. So <laughs> sure. but there are no other questions before we go down with that one. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I would maybe answer a slightly different question. Uh, I, yeah. I I find it very exciting to actually watch all of those, uh, all of the talks and all of the wonderful speakers uh, during this conference. Like I was completely mind blown and uh, it's uh, extremely interesting to see how folks are using it, learning about the use cases, the, like, the various angles, like what folks liked or disliked. And um, uh, that's something that I'm personally excited about. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's something that I, I find it really cool. Um, yeah, I definitely agree on that one. Kind of, kind of cool to see. Also cool to see how how folks are really using it in a very different way, also building completely different mental models of what it is than we've, we've actually built ourselves. <laughs> That's always one of the most interesting <laughs> things. Yeah. As I, as I'm planning my fifth rewrite of the homepage. Um. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's 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 really yeah. hard. Like, I, I like after every talk, you want to slightly adjust how you describe it because, like, oh yeah, that's an interesting angle. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Here's an interesting one. Maybe let's take this before we go into like what are what are interesting upcoming things. Um, more significant disadvantages compared to AWS step functions and ACA serverless. Um, I can't talk much about ACA serverless. I don't really know what are, like what ACA serverless can do. I, I I don't know how much it's different from regular ACA, right? Um, like from regular ACA, I think like the polyglot nature of Link and the statefulness are they're, they're following very different philosophies. I think when it compares to AWS step functions, AWS step functions, the way I understand it is basically a workflow of Lambda functions. Um, so I think statefun is a lot more is a lot more flexible, right? You do have basically um, you do have Basically, think of it as Lambda, just stateful, and they can they can directly talk to each other. You don't even need to define a workflow up front. They can actually dynamically talk to each other just by um, just by addressing the like each other's IDs. Plus, there's this like um, yeah. Plus, there's this virtual actor, virtual stateful actor model behind it, if you wish, so that any anything you send a message to will implicitly be created with with empty state. You can you can directly work with it. You can. You can, you can delete the state. Um, 
it's just I think it's a, it's a, a nice a nicer tighter integration between the computing around around the state than than you get with um, with step functions. Um, I believe there's also the um, an operational cost advantage to it, right? Because of um, um, how set of functions is purely asynchronous uh, message passing based on this model. Let's say a set function on AWS needs to write something to S3. I know that right now um, set of functions doesn't really have a, let's say, S3 event subscriber ingress, but imagine that we do. Um, for us, a little bit step function, if you want to pull or write something to S3 or do anything with it, you would be cost, you would be priced um, the whole time of that step function mm -hmm. waiting on an S3 computation, to, uh, an S3 operation to finish. But with this asynchronous message passing, you would just be priced this little minimal amount of um, generating an event, passing it to someone else, and then waiting for S3 to pass in a mm -hmm. Acknowledgement that some an operation has completed, and you continue to do whatever you need to do um, as a follow-up. Yeah, that's a really um, great point, and I was going to say it it extends even to um, both even to and maybe as importantly to uh, our state management, right? Because if that step function needs to, if yeah. you're tracking counts or whatever state it may be, and you are using DynamoDB or Postgres or some sort of database, that read and write time is part of your Lambda function invocation. Um, and in this model, it's not. So the state is there already when you um, begin computing, and the write happens after the Lambda function completes. So all that I.O. just goes away. And if you can make all of your Lambda functions even you know 75% faster, that's you know a penny each lambda function, and suddenly across thousands of messages, that's going to add up to a lot of like real dollars and cents money saving. Mm -hmm. First, of course, well, the actual price calculation would be a bit more complex here because you have to account for the price of operating yeah. a different cluster. But I, I believe, yeah, yeah but if you look at it overall, there should be a mm -hmm. significant um, save. Mm. Um, unfortunately, I have to drop out because I think I have to prepare the closing notes. But I mean, feel free to stay, stay on a, a, a few more a few more minutes, and let me just throw throw two three words in on on what 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 I'm excited about, like in the future of State Fund, and then maybe Egal and Seth, I'll, I'll leave you with the troublesome task of explaining what that actually is. Um, <laughs> Like one, one, one thing I was, uh, I'm fairly excited about is like during this year, we spent a lot of time on, on what Egal said is this hard task, like figuring out what should actually be like the API surface and so on be to like for, for such a system of that philosophy, like, you know, polyglot event driven, like independently scalable and so on. And I, I think there's, there, there's something we can start based on this now, which is, you know, start, start to look at higher level primitives, right? The, right now, the, it's a, bit, it's a very simple primitive. It's very simple primitives. It's a function sending a message to another function. Um, eventually, I, I think we want to have better ways of, of, of doing more complex interactions. And, and, and there's some, some ideas floating around that I'm very excited about. Maybe you got to Seth. If you want to elaborate on this, if we're not getting kicked out, so I think we might yeah. be out of time. I think, right. getting <laughs> I think if you're interested, you should subscribe to the mailing list and follow us on Twitter and uh, keep track of our updates. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. I hope we could we could share some interesting stuff and so on. And definitely, like, be in touch if you have more questions. We're very very eager to learn. What do you think? <laughs> See you Thanks, guys. Everybody. Thanks, Thank you. Bye.